So today I thought I would cover basically how to play Civilization 4. And I will try to come at this from the perspective of somebody who has played Civilization 5, although not, not a whole lot uh, in comparison to Civilization 4. But I'm tr going to try to explain some of the differences between the two games as well as uh, pretty much give you a sound foundation on how to start because I recently started a playthrough of the 1000 AD uh, scenario in Civilization 4 and some people might not be aware of even how the game is played because it is kind of old. It was originally released in late 2005, which by today's standards, I mean, that's over a decade ago. So um, go back to the main menu and you can click play now. It's the easiest way to get started. And first we're going to have to select a map and there are a lot of different maps, but I'm just going to choose a fractal for this one. It will give me an unpredictable map type. It will be randomly selected from the various available ones. And uh, we're going to see how that works. Now onto the second screen, we have the world size, uh, temperate climate, tropical. We have all different sorts of settings for the various climate. If you have a temperate climate, that's pretty much the standard. Tropical, you'll have more jungles. Arid will be more deserts. Rocky, of course, more mountains. And cold, more tundra. Then you also have the sea level, low, medium, high. Uh, basically controls how much land is on the map and how much water is on the map. Then we move down here to world size. We can select between various world sizes. This will increase or decrease the number of players on the map as well as the actual map size. I'm going to leave it at standard, which I think is what, eight sieves? Don't quote me on that. It uh, The huge map I think holds 12 sieves, but you can put up to 18 if you do a custom map, I think. Not 100% sure about that. So we move on and we get to select a civilization. You can just leave it at random and have a civilization selected for you by the game, or you can go through the various civilizations in the game. Now I am playing Civilization 4 Beyond the Sword, which is the most up-to-date expansion pack for Civilization 4. And that means that I'm going to have some leaders here that uh, players who are either playing the base game or warlords will not have. So just keep that in mind when you can see some of the stuff that's going on here. Um, I'm just going to play Washington because he is pretty much the default leader for America. And there is my name. Yeah. I'm just going to use that. And I mean, if you want to change things here, these are your details. You can rename your empire what you want. I'm sure some people will come up some hilariously dirty stuff in there, but you know, to each of their own. Anyway, we're going to move on to the next screen here. The game snapshot just, just gives you a brief rundown of the world you're going to be playing on, the civilization and leader you're going to be playing. And here you can also select the difficulty and the game speed. Uh, now, quick game speed really doesn't allow you to experience the fullness of the game. Uh, Marathon, of course, is the ideal one where you really get to experience the different eras. But normal, I think, for the average player is the perfect place to start. And then probably Noble, if you've played any of the other Civilization 4 games, uh, Noble is probably a good starting point, uh, really, unless you're, because anything below that, it becomes ridiculously easy to win, uh, based on my experience, even though I seldom play above Noble, because I'm not really looking for a challenge. I know a lot of people play these sorts of games looking for a challenge. And Civilization 4 Beyond the Sword, which is the expansion I'm playing, it is a 4X expansion game. You're supposed to build up an empire to stand the test of time, of course, much like the, the other Civilization games. So the game has finished loading already. Here we have the welcome screen. It basically just tells you what you're going to start off with. We start with fishing and agriculture. Uh, our unique unit is the naval seal, which would only come into play much later in the game, as well as the mall, which replaces the supermarket. Again, both of these uh, one is a unique unit and the other one is a unique building and they both come into play much later in the game. So we don't have to worry about them yet. So I'm just going to click continue and here we are on the map. As you can see, uh, we can adjust. Here we have in the lower right corner, we have the grid so we can see the tiles. We also have the resources button, which will show you all the natural resources. Now, it is ideal to found your city near natural resources so that your city will grow and be much more productive than it normally would when you just have your average tiles. To see the, to see the yields on these tiles, you can either press Control y or click the toggle yield button also here in the lower right corner of the screen, like so. Now, unlike Civilization 5, food is represented in Civilization 4 in the form of bread. And slices of bread, each slice of bread 
uh, will, well, two slices of bread feed one populace in your city. If you see f uh, a loaf of bread, that means there are five individual pieces of bread in that. But I'm getting a bit of ahead of myself talking about cities since we don't even have one yet. Now this unit that I've just selected here is a settler and it will allow us to build a city. So uh, once you have your settler selected, now ideally you would want to settle near to resources right away. Unfortunately in this area that I've currently been placed with the settler, there is no uh, resource immediately within my working range, but there is a floodplains. And as you can see, me moving down one to get the sheep would be of no benefit because I no longer would have access to this, well, I would have access to this floodplains here, but it would lose me a turn in the process of moving down there because it is a forested tile which will require me to spend two movement points and the settler only has two movement points, so I will not be able to move again. So if you want to see how far your unit can move, unlike in Civilization V, you cannot just drag it out by right clicking. You have to uh, click the little move to button here or press G and it will bring up the, uh, the move to, sort of the pathfinding route there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a city right here. It is currently on a hill and is currently next to a river. Both of those are important things. Since my city's on a hill, it will be much more difficult for my enemies to capture it because it receives a plus 25% defensive bonus. And since it is next to a river, I believe it receives two additional health, which is going to be important early on in the game for growing our population. Because health, when it uh, becomes over uh, overly unhealthy, what will happen is the consumption your city will consume more food than usual one more one additional food per unhealthiness over the health limit but see now i'm talking about concepts that are not really familiar to anybody who hasn't played civilization 4 before and that might be strange territory for you so i'm simply going to go ahead and click the build city button here in the taskbar and we have now founded washington if you want to name your settlement something else you're given the opportunity right here we're just going to keep it as Washington because I really have no reason to name it anything else and I'm terrible at coming up with names on the fly. So double clicking the city, now we're in the Washington, we're in the city screen as you can see it kind of similar to what Civilization 5 is except the uh, unit queue is down here. You can select the different units and buildings to build. The buildings currently in the city are on the left side instead. And uh, well, like what I was talking about here, one of the biggest changes from Civilization V in Civilization IV is the health and happiness system. Both of them are localized to the city. Now, I'm pretty sure Civilization V does not have health at all, but Civilization IV does. And if you exceed the current health limit, what will happen is your popu this, the city, the populace in this city will start to consume additional food per each unhealthiness over the current limit. My current limit right now is nine. I have nine total health. Every time I get a new population in this city, I will get an additional unhealthiness. Now, once my unhealthiness exceeds my healthiness, I will consume additional food based on that number. And there are also some buildings that increase unhealthiness, such as the forge. And it's definitely one of the classical era buildings, and you'll be running into it relatively early in the game. Now, another concept that is a bit different in Civilization 4 over Civilization 5, like I just mentioned before, is unhappiness, well, just the happiness mechanic in general. In Civilization 5, it is across your entire empire. Now, in Civilization 4, it depends upon the city you're in. Each city has its own ha uh, happiness meter, and if you go over that, that city will become unhappy, and the, the the peasants, the peasants, the citizens, I should say, that are unhappy will refuse to work. Right now, we have plenty of happiness. There is a total of six happiness, and only one unhappiness from the population. There are various factors that can increase unhappiness, such as war, and I think we'll just leave it at that. So I'm gonna exit by pressing escape, or you can click the center mouse button. And now we have a warrior here. And the thing about the warrior, unlike the scout, some civilizations start with a scout, some start with a warrior. Early on, it would be better for me to have a scout because I'm going to be able to cover much more territory, but the warrior overall is more defensive. Uh, it will last longer in the game world that is very well populated by barbarians most of the time. So we're gonna move over there and start exploring the terrain around here. Hope to score some additional goody huts. Those are the, the runes equivalent from Civilization V. And now we get to choose what we should build in the city. Now, ideally, since I have plenty of food around the city for the city to grow, I should start by building a, a warrior rather than a worker. Because if you build a worker or if you build a settler, I will not be able to grow this city uh, because 
the additional food that that city is taking in is converted into production for the purpose of those two aforementioned units, the worker and the settler. So I'm going to build a warrior, and this is also important because there's another distinctive change here from Civilization V, and that is uh, cities do not defend themselves anymore. Th this city, if a barbarian walked up to it and there isn't a unit in it, it will immediately be captured which is something you definitely don't want to happen early in the, in the game. Although, you know, you usually could build, if you're playing playing against the AI anyway, you would most likely be able to build a worker before anything came to threaten your city. If you're playing against other people, there may be people who decide they want to attack your city right away. But it's never been much of a problem. So we're going to end the turn. The end turn button is located right down here, bottom right corner, or you can press enter. And we're on turn two now, so we can move our warrior. I'm just going to move him up here. And I'm doing I'm moving him by right-clicking on the square I want them to move to. Now we're given the option to research technology. And this is much like the research available on Civilization V. If we click, let's see the big picture, we can see the techno technology advisor. Once again, the, the tech tree is much much the same as it is in Civilization V, although the names of various texts are a bit different here. And um, yeah, we, they want us to pick a research here, so I'll probably, hmm, animal husbandry would be good because it will allow me to build a pasture on the sheep here. Uh, but mining would also be good because I would, it would allow me to build mines around my city to increase production. However, growth should probably be prioritized first, so I'm going to go with animal husbandry, and as an added bonus, that will reveal the horse resources on the map. So I'm just going to continue scouting out here with the warriors. As you can see up above, there is some tundra up here, so I will most likely won't go exploring anymore up there because it's not really desirable land to expand in. As America, I started with the technology that allows me to build fishing boats, and even though we are on the coast, I'm not going to build any because there are no fish resources or any sort of resource I could build an improvement on in the water. So that's the end of turn two. We're going to move on to turn three. And just going to continue to keep exploring here as we wait for our, our research to complete and our warrior in the city to complete as well. And the borders of Washington have now expanded. And this is another interesting thing about Civilization 4 over Civilization 5 is how culture works in Civilization 4. Now, in Civilization 5, your borders will expand in a somewhat erratic manner. They will expand to tiles that are uh, desirable, such as resources. In Civilization 4, it's much more planned out. It just simply expands by one tile each time your border, the, your culture increases to a point where the borders will expand. And maybe for people who aren't familiar with Civilization 5 even, uh, culture is generated through buildings in your city or religions. Uh, currently what is generating culture in Washington, my capital city right here, is the palace, which gives me two culture per turn. And that increased what once my culture hit 10, out of one, well, it was at 10 out of 10. The borders make their first expansion. The next expansion after 10 culture is 100 culture, and that will be 45 turns from now, unless I research a religion, which increases the culture from the religion being in the city, or build a, a, another building that increases culture, or a wonder that increases culture. And it's important to expand your borders because it allows you to control more territory, as well as really be you're able to see the more of the world, you can show more territory, and you can work more tiles, although this fat cross, it is, as it is called in Civilization IV, is the most your cities here can ever work. They cannot work tiles outside of these current squares, even if my borders do expand beyond that. So I'm just going to continue uh, exploring here with the warrior, and just basically see what comes along. So Washington now has grown to size 2, and if we open up this, this city window, we can see what is influencing the growth. Right here on the upper, uh, actually the upper left hand side of the screen, we are seeing where we are making food. We have plus eight food from worked tiles. So our total food production is eight and we're consuming four from the population. So if we look at how this food is being generated, we can see we have two floodplains next to our city. This is excellent, very fast growth because of this. Each floodplain tile yields three food, which is very good early on in the game. And in addition to this, there is also one commerce on each of those tiles as well. So this is pretty much the pinnacle of early game growth is when you have floodplains right next to your city because they will always have that additional commerce, which will increase the rate of production, uh, the rate of research early on in the game. 
and, as well as increasing the growth of your city. So I have a really sweet starting spot right here. And the last two food are coming from the tile the city was founded on. The city's founding tile will always have two food, one hammer, and one commerce, re regardless of where it is founded. You could found it in a desert and it would still get this. You could found it in ice tundra and it would still get this bonus from it. So your city, your town, your your city, I guess it is, will always be able to support at least one population because each population consumes two food and there will always be two food on the tile the city's founded on. So we have completed our first research called Animal Husbandry and this will allow us to build a, both a pasture, which applies to uh, resources like cows and sheep as well as horses, and it also has revealed the horse resource on the map. This, of course, leads to additional resources, uh, researches, I should say, such as riding and horseback riding sometime in the future. And there we found our first horse resource right here in the corner of the map. It was excellent that I researched it as I did, and it would look like probably right here would be a sweet place to found a second village because we're going to have the clam over here once the borders expand and the pig over here, again, once the borders expand. So that will ensure this uh, city placed here would have great growth. And in addition to this, it would be a port because it's right next to the sea. We can tell this is the sea here because you can see this is coastline. And really, there, there aren't many big bodies of water that are enclosed. I'm not sure what the limit is, but if it is too enclosed, like little lakes, your city will not be able to build certain improvements and it will not be able to build certain ships. But I forget what the actual limit to that is for Civilization Four. So now we get to decide on another technology. And I think we're going to pick mining because it's going to lead to bronze working. And we, we want to research bronze working early on so that we can get access to both the copper resource if it's available in my area as well as the slavery civic. And since I have a lot of growth in my cities, I will want uh, to use slavery. And that is because it will allow me to hurry production of buildings for population. I'll be able to exchange population for production, essentially. So Washington has now grown to size three, and I think at about this point, it would be beneficial to build a worker. I have one turn left before my warrior is completed, and then I will begin work on the worker. Okay, here we have the worker. I mean, right there we have the warrior. Now what I did, and I didn't orders. quite explain this early enough, is I clicked the fortify button. It is important to fortify at least one unit in your cities at all times because, as I mentioned earlier, the cities can be captured with a single enemy unit entering its square in Civilization 4, unlike in Civilization 5 where cities have some sort of native defense. Ideally, you would want at least two units in uh, per city to defend them, and warriors are definitely a weak choice, but it will suffice early on. I would not build more than one warrior, though, because it's generally a waste of time for production. Now, unfortunately, the city has started an additional warrior, and this is because I'm playing with a certain mod that, that gives the user interface additional information. It basically automates a lot of tasks, and unfortunately, that is a consequence of that. Overall, it does not influence the, the play of the game. The game is exactly the same. It's just it has you user interface enhancements and allows you to see like more information without having to dig for it. So that's not going to be a problem for anybody um, who is actually playing the base, uh, playing the game without the mod that I'm currently using, the interface mod, because that's all it is. Just, in, just changes the interface a bit. Uh, okay, so I switched production over here to a worker, and this was something that I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that the city will stop growing. And this is because the additional food is consumed by the worker. So as you can see here, our base production is four hammers, and then we're getting an additional two hammers from the food, the additional food that I have, I'm getting out of my, my city. And then we have an additional 25% production for this worker because I am an expansive leader. That is one of my leader traits. Washington has leader traits. As you can see by hovering over the flag here, I'm expansive, which gives me an additional two health per city, 25% faster production of workers, and double production speed of both the granary and the harbor. And that will come into play during the game. And the thing is, different leaders have different traits, so you really can't predict any... I mean, if you're going to be playing Washington, your experience here would be similar to mine. But if you're playing any other leader, you'd have to look at their own unique traits. And now we have met our first other civilization. As you might notice, the, the leader... Uh, it's a little bit different. I think some people laugh at some of these animations. They think it's 
It's terrible. I personally like the the smaller format instead of having an have to having to load an entire screen, but that is personal preference. And I can acknowledge some people enjoying the increased fidelity of the larger, uh, more set piece and epic style leader interfaces. So anyway, he makes a joke about uh, his salad, and we're just going to say that we want peace in our time. Okay, I've completed my second technology, mining, and this will allow me to build a mine on top of hills, as well as allow me to research bronze working. I'm just going to move my worker there. I mean my wire. I keep calling my wire a worker. That is a wire. I'm currently building a worker. Next, I'm going to research bronze working. Now, if I wanted to go for a religion, I'd probably want to research mysticism. And it might actually be beneficial for me to try for a religion because that would the religion mechanic is rather unique in Civilization 4 as opposed to other Civilization games. Pretty much the, the most in-depth religion system. So I'm going to go ahead and research mysticism. Now, I'm not going to be able to find Buddhism most likely. Okay, there it is. Speak of the devil. Buddhism has already been founded, but hopefully we can either hit Hinduism or Judaism. Um, yeah, most likely. We're going to... On second thought, if we go for Hinduism, if we miss it, we will still get uh, Judaism. And very few people research that. Very few AIs research that far, it seems like. Nature herself has imprinted on the So we have now completed mysticism, which unlocks both the monument building and the Stonehenge wonder. And it will allow us to research Hinduism as the next technology. There we go. Uh, actually, polytheism is what we're researching as a technology, but it will found the religion Hinduism if we are the first to successfully research it. And I'm hopeful that we will be because we actually have the additional commerce from these two tiles right there. And the benefit to really founding religion in this game is it increases the culture in your cities. Oh boy. All right, now I'm sandwiched here in between two barbarians, but we should have a couple of free wins, so I'm not too concerned. Yeah, both both of them attacked, and we won. But uh, attacks after this from the barbarians, and maybe I didn't explain the barbarians too well right there. There are various units in the world that do not belong to every, any civilization. They are called barbarians, and they will generally just spawn in the areas of the map that are not currently civilized. In other words, they're not within a civilization's line of sight of their borders. So now here I've completed my first worker, and you can see the game is already suggesting tiles I should improve. I could either improve the floodplains, or I could improve the sheep resource. Now, I don't think I can actually build cottages. Cottages is what you sh usually put on floodplains. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the tile over there and build a pasture first. So now that I've completed a worker, I probably should build a settler next. It is a good question. It's pretty much a tie between a building and the, I would like to have built an archer next, but we're going to build a settler instead. And they actually beat us to Hinduism. Okay, we're going to go. We're, we are going to continue on this line and try to hit Judaism. I just got attacked by. A lion, a barbarian lion, and maybe this is something else I should explain. Your units can heal after being attacked. So that's what I'm doing there. Four turns. Units heal faster in friendly territory, slower in neutral territory, and very slow in enemy territory. The census area is not controlled by any civilization. It is considered neutral territory, and therefore the rate of healing is just slow. Okay, so we have now completed our first resource improvement, and that is the sheep right here. So we've built a pasture on top of the sheep, and that increased the production of food in it from three to five, and it also gave us one commerce on that tile. And maybe that sort of uh, should segue into another point that I should make that changes in Civilization Four from Civilization Five, and that is how research is generated. Now, in Civilization V, research is generated by having population in your cities, but in, re in Civilization IV, research is generated through commerce. You choose how to allocate your commerce. There are four different ones. I currently haven't unlocked uh, culture yet, but you can either uh, commit your 
commerce to making gold, to making espionage points, which are used to spy again on other civilizations, or to making research points, which is used to complete and research stuff like what I'm doing right here with polytheism. The fourth one is the drama slider. It allows you to focus on turning or converting the commerce on your that your city is generating into culture. And it's probably one of the, f the least used ones, in my opinion. Increasing your rate of culture will also increase your city's happiness, but the hit you take in um, science would not justify it unless you are going strictly for a cultural victory. And it is really the only case when that would be justifiable to use that. And then the espionage, as I pointed out. So we're going to take a look at the espionage. You can dedicate uh, commerce to this to increase the amount of espionage you make. Right now, we only have met Julius Caesar, so he's the only one that we can actually uh, dedicate or allocate espionage points towards. However, as we meet more civilizations, our espionage points are going to be stretched a bit thinly. There are various benefits to having espionage points, such as in this case, I can now see his demographics, which are on this window. Right there, the demographics bar. But I think that will pretty much conclude it for episode one of my Civilization 4 tutorial. I will pick back up later, and uh, I hope to see you then.